be seated. Praise the Lord, I am more than a conqueror. Our topic again tonight is kingdom advancement prayer. Is every believer's responsibility. Can you say it's my responsibility? Kingdom advancement prayer is not just for intercessors or prayer warriors as we have it in some congregations or maybe so for pastors or ordained workers. If you get saved today, you must start praying today. It's not something you go to school to learn. Every believer's responsibility. It is part of your contribution towards the kingdom, advancement of the kingdom. There are no special people who have the gift of prayer. No. There is no such thing as gift of prayer. Just like driving a car is not a gift. You just learn it and you begin to drive. You know that uh, I don't have the gift of driving a car. Amen. If you don't know, if you can't drive a car, you have no land. Or, or perhaps you are disabled. But as long as you are not disabled, it's not a gift, not a special gift. In fact, flying an aircraft is not a special gift. It's a training. Amen. You train as a pilot, then you can fly an aircraft. So in the same way, every believer can pray and every believer ought to pray. And prayer is our calling. We are called to be king and priest unto God. A priest is an intercessor, a sort of mediator that stands between people and God. He takes people's petition, supplication, challenges to God in prayer, their need. Receives answer from God unto the people. God will always need people to stand in the gap. He said, I sought for a man to stand in the gap. I didn't find any, so the people there were destroyed. Our generation shall not be destroyed. In the mighty name of Jesus. The church is called the salt of the earth. We and we alone can preserve the earth from decadence, from pollution, from destruction. Until the church prays the way it ought to pray, souls may not be saved in the numbers that we expect them to be saved. So prayer must continue in church, must be intense, must be fervent. Of course, must be acceptable unto the Lord. So we must pray in such a way that God accepts our petition. And when that is done, the church will keep growing like never before. The most important activity in the house of the Lord is prayer. That is why the Bible said in Mark eleven seventeen, my house shall be called the house of prayer. The house of prayer. The house of prayer. That means the body of Christ is a family of praying men and women. Praying men and women. If you are not involved in praying, you have considered yourself an outcast in the body of Christ. And then you can become a victim, like it was said yesterday, if you are too casual in this exercise, you can end up a casualty. It's like a, a soldier who is too casual in battlefront. He's checking his belt and polishing his shoe. I hope my shoe is shining, you know. <laughs> in the battlefield where bullets are flying here and there. Amen. If you are too casual in the battlefield, you may end up a casualty. And Christianity is a call, a battle call. That's why we are described as soldiers, soldiers of the Lord, soldiers of Christ. You must never joke with prayer in your life. The best way to enjoy life as a Christian is to learn to pray and pray continuously. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Rejoice evermore. And then, one way to rejoice evermore is given to us in verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Then the next thing says, in everything, give thanks unto God. Praise God. God wants you to be joyful. But to live a joyful life, you must live a prayerful life and a life full of gratitude. 
That was exactly the lifestyle of Jesus Christ. Even Jesus Christ was not exempted, though he was God in human flesh, but was not exempted from this exercise of prayer. If there's anybody who could walk into God's bedroom or anywhere and say, this is what I want, and drop the list, you know, and just say, send a WhatsApp message to God, and that's just enough. I think Jesus Christ qualifies for that. Praise God. But look at Luke chapter 6, verse 12. The Bible said, Luke chapter 6, verse 12, in those days. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain. He left his house, his comfort zone, into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And in those days, people go to bed very early. So probably by 8, people have gone to bed because it's not like the days of street light and so much commercial activities. So probably Jesus will go to the mountain by 8. You pray 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, probably 5 and 6. And then early in the morning, he's coming down from the mountain. What is he praying for? He didn't have a wife. He didn't have children. He wasn't praying for a job. So it must have been all through praying for kingdom advancement, enlargement. Not personal supplication. No. All through the night. Praying. And in verse 17, the multitude gathered. In verse 17 of that Luke chapter 6. After he had prayed all through the night, in the morning, he said, and he came down with them and stood in the plain. And the company of his disciples, he said, and a great multitude of people of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sodom, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. The multitude gathered. The secret why Jesus commanded the multitudes in his ministry was his lengthy praying, his continuous praying. That is why in Luke 18 verse 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint. If you faint in prayer, you must tell yourself, I'm not living the kind of life I ought to live. Praise God. It is a big risk as a Christian not to pray. It's better to be an unbeliever than to be a lukewarm Christian. Amen. The moment you declare for Christ, you have made yourself the enemy of the devil, act enemy of the devil. And your only protection is continuity on the prayer order. That is just the truth. Every child of God is ordained the house of prayer because we are the temple of the Holy Ghost. So inside you, prayer must be going on. Externally, prayer must be going on. You must have the spirit of prayer upon you continuously, all the time. Please make praying kingdom as much as prayer a priority in your life. Let it be part of your daily lifestyle. And you will see how sweet your life will be. That is one way to dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It gives you boldness, confidence, happiness. It helps you to walk from victory to victory. Praise God. It makes you know that God is always with you. Like Jesus said, my father has never let me because I do always those things that are pleasing unto him. And kingdom advancement prayer is one of those things that pleases the Lord. That is why Jesus Christ of Nazareth lived a lifestyle of prayer. Praise God. One Old Testament example of a praying man is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was just a staff in the king's palace. A cup bearer. But he was always moved with the challenges of the kingdom. Many are never moved Probably when they see, oh, attendance in church is no longer the way it used to be before. Oh, the number of people in different units, ushering units, choir units, is for, but not for Nehemiah. He heard the news. Somebody came from Jerusalem and told him the walls of Jerusalem are broken down, they are fallen. And then his content has changed to the point that the king took note. This is not you. That, that shows you that Nehemiah was a very joyful person. Every day you see Jeremiah smiling, happy. So, it was a different day. If Jeremiah was ever, ever, always gloomy, there are some Christians that they are always gloomy, always depressed, always angry, always complaining. 
Even if they told you, if Jeremiah was that kind of person that they told Jeremiah, uh, the king, or even the king looked at him, so oh, he has come again. That's just that man. But the king knew that this is unusual. Something is wrong with Nehemiah. He's a joyful man. He's a happy man. Praise God. So he said, why is your countenance like this? I see you are not sick, but you are sort of. And Nehemiah knew that even before a physical king, it was risky not to be joyful. How much more God? Amen. The Bible said he was afraid that the king noted that he's sorrowful because probably the king will interpret it that he's uh, complaining or rebelling. But one thing we notice about Jeremiah is that when the king said, okay, ask what you want, I'm going to do it, he went back to God in prayer. He built that wall of Jerusalem in 52 days by combination of prayer and hard work. Prayer and diligence. Prayer. In every step, he took prayer. To build back a church that have suffered under COVID and lockdown, we need to engage the Jeremiah style. Diligence in administration. Diligence in soul winning. And also diligence on the prayer altar. Because most churches in South Africa is like in the circumstance situation that Israel was, the walls were broken down. That means no defense. A lot of people have vacated Israel there. And the wild animals were already taken over. But Nehemiah said, this city shall be rebuilt. This city shall be built back. There was opposition. There was criticism. There was mockery. But he continued because he was a praying man. So he built back the kingdom of Israel, of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, because he kept praying. If we keep preaching and keep evangelizing and keep following up and keep singing without taking prayer seriously, giving it the kind of attention and intensity it demands, our effort will be futile. We will not amount to much. In fact, evangelism is only as effective as the prayer that precedes it and the prayer that follows it. This is why we shall not just win souls, but we shall pray for the establishment of the soul. A church grows only because souls are abiding, not that souls are coming. If souls keep coming, it doesn't matter how many people come to church. What matters most is how many people abide. For instance, if 50 people join us on Sunday and 60 people disappear, <laughs> 60 old people didn't come, but 50 new people came, uh, you will discover that the attendance does not increase. So it doesn't matter how many people came to church. The most important thing is how many are abiding. How many are abiding? How many old people are abiding? How many new ones are abiding? Even if the new ones are abiding and the old ones are running away, the church will still grow. For instance, if we have 500 new people this year who are abiding and uh, we lost 700 old members the same year, they, I mean, the church is not growing in numbers. It's decreasing. This is why we must keep praying, particularly for new converts, that they abide. That was the lifestyle of Jesus. That was the method of Jesus. That was the method of the apostles. Praise God. It takes fervency on the prayer altar to keep souls in church. It takes prayer to bring them. It takes prayer to keep them. It takes prayer for them to see the reason to remain. Like in Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 3, Verse 14, Paul said, For this purpose, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 15, he said, In whom the whole family, heaven and earth, is named. Then verse 16, he began to share his prayer points that he will grant unto you in Ephesus, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with mind by his spirit in the inner man. Let them be strengthened. That's prayer point. 17, he said, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith. When Christ is dwelling in your heart, you fall in love with Christ more. You think about him. So you can receive Christ. This he was talking about the church. You can receive Christ without Christ that dwelling in your heart by faith. That he being rooted and grounded in love. That's another prayer point. Verse 18. May be able to comprehend with all sense what is the breadth, length, depth, and height. So, if their understanding should be enhanced so that they, they see the reason to be titans, to be stewards, to serve, to obey, to see the reason to do the things that they are taught, 
their eyes should be open, and it takes prayer for their eyes to be open. Then he said, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Ephesians 6, 18 tells us everyone needs prayer. Everyone needs prayer. Otherwise, people will be falling out. He said, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. For all saints. Most especially for newcomers. For all saints. For all saints. If we stop praying for some people, they will start perishing. They will start perishing. Samuel saw it as a sin not to pray for Israel. He said, you people are not behaving fine. But God forbid that I should stop praying for you. Amen. If we don't pray, we end up a prey. There are forces in this nation that wants to swallow up churches. There are forces that want to swallow up even a church like Winner Chapel. Some churches have closed down because of the pandemic. Some churches have sold their property. They are no longer functioning. There are government policies. There are situations, circumstances out there to swallow up churches. And the church must rise and lift up a standard from the prayer altar against forces, against institutions, against policies that try to swallow up churches. If the church does not pray the way it ought to pray, the church will end up a prey in the belly of the enemy. Can you say God forbid? That is what is our responsibility. Responsibility as God's servant have defined it is responding to a God-given ability. Everyone baptized in the Holy Ghost can pray because the Holy Ghost is the spirit of prayer. The Holy Ghost is the spirit of prayer. One of the evidences that the Holy Ghost at work in the life of a believer is that there is a desire and urge a stirring up to pray and keep praying and continue prayer. Praise God. In Colossians 4 verse 12, we see a man in the church of Colossae, Epaphras. He said, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you. Always, 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 always laboring fervently for you in prayers. Your prayer life, you should be described as such a person that prays always. Have a scheduled time of prayer. If possible, have a prayer diary. Don't just live your life without considering how you pray. What time, what quantity of time, what percentage of time you are allowed to prayer on a daily basis. Set out time for this business. Prayer is business. Kingdom business. Give it time on a daily basis. Otherwise, many activities will come and you may forget. Or you may engage in some activities and you don't feel to pray anymore. There's a way you can engage in so much talking, so much entertainment, so much amusement, so much eating, so much feasting. And then, even when you remember to pray, you don't feel like praying. You know, there are times when you want to pray. You say, God bless us. God bless <laughs> This one, no, no, no. I can't deceive myself. I can't deceive myself. This is no prayer. Amen. And they can continue like that one week, two weeks. Praise God. A man of God once said, One week without prayer makes a Christian weak. And that is true. Try it. I will don't try it. <laughs> you can try it and you'll be gone forever. Not recovering. One week without prayer makes a Christian weak. If you truly know. What Christianity is all about. Even you feel it. You know you are just weak. You, you can even feel weakness in you. When your prayer life draws. Praying for new converts. Is like giving birth. That is why. Paul used travel to describe it. In Galatians chapter 4 verse 19. My little children. Of whom I travel. In birth again. Until Christ is formed. In you. I will keep doing this until Christ is formed in you. That means until the nature of Christ, the character of Christ, the principles of Christ is formed in you. And if Christ is formed in you, it shall be evident in your outward manifestation. 
outward lifestyle. The evidence that Christ is formed in a man is that he's living it out in such a way that people can say, ah, this person, this woman, this man is a true child of God. Praise the Lord. So this is a call to a life of prayer like never before. And God sees our level of prayer in the secret. And the Bible said he's committed to rewarding us openly. If I do this thing willingly, then there is a reward. And the reward is in diverse ways. There is monetary reward, material reward, and rewards that money cannot buy. Amen. If I do this thing willingly, there is a reward. So let's not do it for show's sake. Let's do it as unto the Lord, personally, if possible, secretly, and then we see the reward coming. Amen. God's servant will always say, those that make news don't make noise. Don't seek to impress anyone. Praise God. Oh. It's better to have a testimony not shared than to share testimonies people cannot see. Amen. Testimony. I mean, it's better people are seeing your testimony and you're not even talking about it. And you are talking about your testimony all the time and nobody is seeing it. Praise God. There's nothing wrong with sharing testimonies. But it's better for your life to be a testimony. It's better for people to say, this man is blessed. They can see the blessing. Than to keep telling people, I am blessed, I am blessed. And the one they say, where is the blessing? Kingdom advancement prayer will always transform your life. And make your life a message. An example. A testimony of God's goodness. Of God's blessing. Of God's honor. Don't seek to impress anyone. Seek to impress God. For even when a man's way please the Lord, he makes his enemies to be at peace with him. The evidence of still worship will show in your life. Even when there's a delay, it will come. Even when there's a delay, it will come. Because God cannot deny himself. He said, when we pray in secret, he rewards us openly. When we fast in secret, he rewards us openly. When we give in sacred, he rewards us openly. For God is not unjust to forget your level of love in that you minister to the saints and do minister. Rise to your feet tonight.